All right, folks, let's go over what you will need to study for your test on animals. In your VIP section, you have this big packet that you use as you watch your classmates' presentations. The most important page to know is the front page. You are responsible for knowing all of these terms. You can think of them as a lens through which to understand the rest of the information in this packet. You do not need to have this whole packet memorized like we talked about in class. This is a great level of detail. I'm just expecting that you generally understand these terms and how to apply them to the different animals groups. We also have this simplified study guide note sheet, which we color coded. And then if you flip to labs and projects, you'll find your animals introductory web quest as well as the materials for your animals project. That might be helpful. And as always, your unit portfolio, and glossary will help you study for this test. As always, you can find a bunch of useful resources if you log into Student View or Phoenix. You can find full copies and blank copies of the notes under the tab, what's the homework and what do I need to study? I have some review games posted under the tab review games, and you can find links to this and other helpful videos under the link Miss E's videos. Additional online resources can be found by going to your Google Classroom because that's going to offer you all of the in-depth research that your classmates did on various animal topics. Let's first talk about the classification of the animal kingdom. If we recall this pyramid, going from most general with domain to most specific for species. When we're talking about animals, we're talking about a kingdom, the kingdom Animalia. This is part of the domain Eukarya. So our domain is Eukarya, our kingdom is Animalia. All animals are consumers, which means that they must eat other organisms to get their energy. They cannot make energy themselves through photosynthesis or chemosynthesis. Another way of saying this is saying that animals are heterotrophic or heterotrophs. All animals are also multicellular, meaning that they're made of more than one cell. And all of these cells are eukaryotic meaning that they contain a nucleus and membrane-bound organelles. Of course, this makes sense as animals are part of the domain Eukarya. I'd like you to imagine for a second the names of as many animals as you can think of. Probably most of the animals that are coming to mind right off the top of your head are mammals and birds. But mammals and birds, while they are familiar to us, only make up a small fraction of known species in the animal kingdom. This is a pie chart that's showing the approximate breakdown of different kinds of animals in the animal kingdom. All of the parts that are yellow represent insects. As you can see, the biggest single group of insects is beetles. The section that represents mammals is We see that sponges, worms, and mollusks, as well as other invertebrates, make up a significant chunk, but definitely more than we see for mammals. And this is just the known species. This is an approximation of a cladogram or a diagram of evolution for the animal kingdom. Remember, the farther back in time on the line, the lower this is, and each vertex represents an extinct common ancestor. So we see the most recent to evolve would be our chordates, our chordata, phylum, which includes the classes fish, reptiles, amphibians, birds, and mammals. And our earliest animals are sponges, porifera. As time passes, we see branching off from these various common ancestors to find animals with different traits. Early on, animals like sponges that exist today are sessile, they're filter feeders, they don't have a lot of the complex structures that we might see in mammals, for example today. Over time, the evolution of limbs and segmented bodies and the ability to regulate body temperature evolved. But it all started out with very simple organisms similar to the sponges we see today. Our simplest animals are the sponges in the phylum Porifera. These organisms do not have backbones or nervous systems and they don't move. Cnidarians are our next phylum of animals. These animals are able to move and they all contain stinging cells. Next, we have worms. Worms are not in a phylum all by themselves. When we were talking about the category of worms, we were talking about a lot of different phyla, but worms in general have bilateral symmetry. They are a little bit more complex than the sponges and cnidarians that we've seen before, which have no symmetry and radial symmetry, respectively. Worms include flatworms, roundworms, and segmented worms. Another phylum we learned about is mollusca, or the mollusk phylum. This phylum includes animals that are considered bivalves, like clams and oysters that have two shells, gastropods like snails and slugs, and cephalopods like squids, octopus, and cuttlefish. 
The phylum Arthropoda consists of animals that have jointed feet or legs. These include arachnids like spiders and ticks, crustaceans like crabs and lobsters, and insects like butterflies and mosquitoes. Echinoderms, a phylum of spiny skin creatures, include sand dollars, starfish, brittle stars, and sea cucumbers. The next several groups I will talk about all belong to the same phylum, chordata, animals with a backbone. The first we'll talk about is ichthys, or fish. Animals in this class, ichthys, include bony fish, the kind of fish that you're typically going to imagine if I said the word fish, jawless fish, and cartilaginous fish, such as sharks and stingrays. Amphibians get their name because they lead a double life. They start out their life in the water, breathing through gills, and then they go through metamorphosis to turn into animals like frogs, toads, Sicilians, and salamanders. The adult versions of these organisms breathe either through their skin or with lungs, but they started off breathing through gills. Reptiles all have dry, scaly skin and include animals like alligators, turtles, and snakes. Aves means birds. Birds all have feathers, though not all of them fly. Some swim, and some are very fast runners. Perhaps the class of animals with which we are most familiar, seeing as we're a part of it ourselves, would be mammalia, the mammal class. Mammals all feed their young milk and are covered in body hair or fur. We talked about three kinds of mammals, placental mammals, monotremes, and marsupials. Placental mammals carry their babies internally before they are born. Monotremes lay eggs out of which their babies hatch, and marsupials give birth to tiny immature babies that go on to develop in a pouch. I'm going to go through and compare and contrast these groups using various criteria. I'm going to be mainly operating off of this list, so if you have these notes, I would pull them out and use this to follow along. But if you're just watching at home without these notes, hopefully this will still be informative. Let's start with vertebrates versus invertebrates. Vertebrates are animals that have a skull and a backbone, while invertebrates lack these traits. In terms of evolutionary history, invertebrates came first. Vertebrates evolved from invertebrates. Let's first look at invertebrates. Worms, echinoderms, arthropods, sponges, mollusks, and cnidarians are all invertebrates, meaning they do not have a backbone. On the other hand, mammals, reptiles, birds, amphibians, and fish all have backbones and skulls. Thus, they are all vertebrates. Now let's talk about symmetry. There are three ways that we talked about how animals can show symmetry or not. Asymmetry means that animals have no lines of symmetry, meaning that they are kind of amorphous and can't be evenly divided. Radial symmetry we called wheel symmetry. This means that when looked at from the viewpoint of a center point, an animal is the same all the way around. Bilateral symmetry, which is the most complex, is when an animal has one line of symmetry showing similar if not identical structures on either side of their body. The only animals that show asymmetry are in the phylum Porifera. Sponges have no symmetry, thus they are said to be asymmetrical. Depending on the species and the phase in the life cycle, radial symmetry can be found in both the phylum Echinodermata and the phylum Cnidaria. Animals such as coral and jellyfish, cnidarians, as well as some species of starfish, sand dollars, and brittle stars demonstrate radial symmetry, meaning that they are the same all the way around a center point. All of these groups of animals, the classes amphibia, mammalia, ichthys, reptilia, and aves, as well as the phyla, mollusca, all of the different phyla of worms and arthropoda, all demonstrate bilateral symmetry, meaning that if you were to draw an imaginary line down the center of any of these organisms, they would be almost perfect mirror images on either side. This is the most complex kind of body symmetry that we see. The next way we're going to compare these animal groups is talking about their regulation of their body temperature. You may have heard the terms before cold-blooded and warm-blooded. As scientists, we are going to use the terms ectotherms or ectothermic and endotherms or endothermic. Cold-blooded or ectothermic animals Animals cannot regulate their own body temperature. Instead, their body processes are controlled by the external environmental temperature. Endotherms, or warm-blooded animals, on the other hand, are able to maintain a fairly steady body temperature regardless of their external environment. This is a more high-level evolutionary strategy. As a result, it requires a lot more food energy to keep an endotherm alive. 
This is why you may hear about ectothermic animals like snakes eating a meal every day, perhaps, or maybe every week, or for some, even less frequently than that. Whereas mammals and birds, our endothermic animals, must eat almost constantly to maintain their body processes. Let's first talk about some ectotherms. All of these different animal groups are ectotherms. Sponges, cnidarians, echinoderms, mollusks, arthropods, and worms, these are all of our ectotherms that are also invertebrates. But fish, reptiles, and amphibians are also ectotherms. These would all be considered cold-blooded animals because they cannot regulate their own body temperature. If the environment in which they are living becomes too hot or too cold, they will die. There exist only two classes of endothermic or warm-blooded animals, birds and mammals. There is one unique species of an endothermic fish called the deep sea opa, but otherwise fish would be considered ectotherms. Only birds and mammals can regulate their own body temperature. Now let's talk about skeletal structures. Some animals have no skeleton whatsoever. Others have an exoskeleton made of chitin that provides structure outside of the body's soft tissues. An endoskeleton, which is probably what you imagine when you think of the word skeleton, is a structure of bone or cartilage on the inside of the body. Sponges, worms, cnidarians, and mollusks lack a skeleton. This means that they have no skeletal structure to protect them, and their bodies are very soft. Some mollusks, however, have shells that provide a little bit of protection, but those are not considered skeletal structures. Arthropods, which include insects, crustaceans, and arachnids, like this spider, have an exoskeleton. It's no surprise here that all of our animals that are considered chordata, that have backbones, have endoskeletons. But what I think is especially interesting is that we have one invertebrate, Echinodermata, that has an endoskeleton. Even though this phylum does not have a backbone, it still has an internal skeletal structure. Now let's talk about mobility. While most animals are able to move on their own and are considered mobile, some cannot move on their own, and they're considered sessile. Sponges as a phylum are sessile. Cnidarians, such as coral and other cnidarians at various stages in their life cycle, can also be considered to be sessile. Worms, mollusks, echinoderms, arthropods, cnidarians, fish, reptiles, amphibians, birds, and mammals are all considered mobile. Depending on the species of animal, some of these animals will get around by slithering, crawling, swimming, walking, gliding, or flying. Now let's talk about breathing or gas exchange. All animals breathe in oxygen and breathe out carbon dioxide. There are a variety of different ways that oxygen can enter an animal's body and carbon dioxide can leave. Some organisms use diffusion, which relies on a concentration gradient with a lot of oxygen outside of the cells and a little bit of oxygen inside of the cells to work. This means that the oxygen goes from high to low, go with the flow, and enters cells. There's a higher concentration of carbon dioxide in the cells, so that's going to go high to low as well, going from the high concentration inside of the cell to a lower concentration outside of the cell. Other organisms use gills, special structures that help get dissolved oxygen out of water. Insects use spiracles, which are little holes for breathing on the sides of their bodies. And more advanced organisms use lungs. Worms, echinoderms, sponges, and cnidarians all use diffusion to get oxygen into their cells and carbon dioxide out. Fish, aquatic mollusks, baby amphibians, and aquatic arthropods will use gills to breathe. Insects will use spiracles to breathe. Arachnids use structures called book lungs, while terrestrial mollusks, adult amphibians, birds, mammals, and reptiles use lungs to breathe. Animals can reproduce in two main ways. Some animals are able to asexually reproduce, meaning that they can make a clone of themselves by breaking off a part of their body and having it grow into another full organism with the same DNA. Sexual reproduction requires cells from two different parent organisms that join to create a genetically unique organism. Sexual reproduction is a more advanced way of reproducing because it creates more variety in the possible offspring generations. Sponges, cnidarians, and flatworms can reproduce asexually, but all animals under the right conditions can reproduce sexually. 
There's a great variety in the ways that animals can get energy to survive. All animals, like we said before, are consumers, which means that they are heterotrophic. Some of these consumers are herbivores, meaning that they eat only plants. Others of these consumers are carnivores, meaning that they eat only other animals. And some are omnivores, meaning that they eat both plant matter and animal matter. A subset of carnivores would be scavengers. Scavengers eat the leftover remains that they did not hunt themselves, but are kind of leftover scraps from another animal hunting. Another subset of carnivores would be parasites, animals that live in or on other organisms and harm them. Another energy obtaining pathway that an animal might take would be that of a decomposer. Decomposers break down dead matter at a very small microscopic level and return those nutrients to cycles in nature. Now for the part where I'm going to talk really, really fast. Animals can be broken down into 11 general groups. Let's start by looking at vertebrates versus invertebrates. Mammals, amphibians, birds, reptiles, and fish are vertebrates, meaning that they have a backbone. Echinoderms, cnidarians, mollusks, worms, sponges, and arthropods are invertebrates, meaning that they do not have a backbone. Arthropods, you'll recall, include arachnids, such as spiders and scorpions, insects like butterflies and mosquitoes, and crustaceans like lobsters and crabs. Mollusks include bivalves like clams, gastropods like slugs, and cephalopods like octopus. Worms can be flat, round, or segmented. Fish can be bony, jawless, or cartilaginous. And mammals fall under placental, marsupial, or monotreme categories. Animals get their energy a variety of ways, though all animals are consumers. This means that they are all heterotrophs. Animals can be scavengers, carnivores, parasites, decomposers, herbivores, or omnivores. Depending on the situation, animals may reproduce asexually or sexually. Animals might be mobile or sessile. Animals might possess bilateral, radial, or no symmetry. Animals might have internal skeletons, external skeletons, or no skeletons at all. They might breathe through diffusion, high low, go with the flow, lungs, spiracles, or gills. They can be warm-blooded endotherms or cold-blooded ectotherms. But at the end of the day, all of these animals that we know and love are heterotrophic, eukaryotic, multicellular creatures in the domain Eukarya and the kingdom Animalia.